I'm very excited to be chatting with Arash Hashemi, an attorney with a podcast of his own called Hashing Out the Law. How are you doing today, sir? I'm good. How are you, Steve? Great. Thanks so much for joining me. I was really excited to speak with you because I work with a lot of future lawyers and they often want to know what is the practice of law actually like? They're watching a lot of movies, TV shows like Suits. How does the media portrayal differ from the reality? So when I was a kid, I wanted to be in the NBA. That's, that was my goal. And uh, we had this family doctor who, who, whose friend in medical school was a Lakers doctor. And, and he was a basketball fan. And he always talked to me about basketball. And he asked me, what do you want to do when you grow up? I was about the eighth grade. And I go, I want to be in the NBA. And he told me, well, why don't you be a lawyer? I go, what? I never thought about being a lawyer. He goes, why don't you be a lawyer? Because um, you're good at speaking and you like arguing. So something clicked in my head and I said, I want to be a lawyer. And I didn't I didn't know what being a lawyer was like. So to me, being a lawyer was what I saw on TV, you know, Perry Mason, Law and Order, all these law shows. Um, and I wanted to be a lawyer and I wanted to practice mainly criminal law for, for the romanticism that the TV made it look like. And I was fascinated with these people. Then I became a lawyer. It's nothing like you see on TV. Nothing. I, I used to love Law and Order. I hate it. I can't watch it. I yell at it. My, my dad and my brother love it and they watch it and I yell at the TV. I'm like, no, that's not how you do it. No, no, that law and order takes basically like a murder case or if you have SUV, they have a, a rape murder case and they go from the arrest to the end of the trial and sometimes beyond the trial within an hour. Those things take years. They take years. Um, the other thing is people think that once you're a lawyer, there is a, a line of people outside of your door just waiting to give you money. You know, you're a lawyer now, you're making all this money because everybody wants to give you money. That's not true. That's not true at all. Um, being a lawyer is like being anybody else. If you're working on your, you know, if you have your own office working on your own, you basically have to have different hats. You have to be a banker. You have to be a, a advertising agent. You have to be um, a salesman. You, you're not just a lawyer because you have to actually have clients. And how do you get clients? You have to advertise, you have to network, you have to you know, let yourself be known. So they don't talk about that. Um, those are just the, some of the things. Um, we could go on for years and days, but being a lawyer on TV is so much fun. Not that being a lawyer in real life isn't, but there's no drama that goes with it. You know, it, it just, it's just like the movie in, in any movie you watch. Have you ever seen people like engage in personal stuff in a TV show? No, it's just the story that they're trying to portray and they have this limited time and that's what they do with the practice of law. Right, right. It's kind of like Superman never goes to the bathroom and Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook became like an overnight hit just like that, right? Right. right. So they don't have, ever see the, the work behind the scenes. Exactly. Yeah. One of the things uh, law schools have gotten a lot of criticism for in recent years as the economy has gotten tougher is that they're teaching law students the, the theory of the law, but not teaching them the business of the law. Right. So I'm wondering when you, you're very prominent online, you've got your YouTube, your podcast, your website, and I'm assuming law school didn't teach you any of that. Law school didn't. So law school doesn't even really teach you how to be a lawyer. Law school teaches you the law and teach, you know, helps you pass the bar. Um, in my law school, we were lucky we had this one semester class, which was um, designed to teach you how to be a lawyer. So what they, they took the class and they broke you up into like two different firms. And then they gave you these, these cases and you had to try the cases and you had discovery dates due and, and things like that. And your final exam was uh, the judge was the, I'm sorry, the, the teacher was the judge and you actually had to try a case in front of the teacher. That was your final exam. So I was lucky to have that. Um, some law schools don't even have that, but they definitely don't teach you how to be a businessman, how to, how to run a business, um, you know, how to, how to have your practice grow. So I think that's something that they, they need to do, law schools. They need, to, they need to teach how to, the business aspect of it, like you stated. I, I learned it by trial and error, by trial and error. Um, I did have some older mentors that I got to pick their brains, but you know, times change. Some of the people that, that were my mentors, they didn't grow up with technology. They, they didn't have 
Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. Um, there was no PDFs, you know, they did things by hand. So uh, trial by and error is, is, is the way I learned. And I made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes and I continue to, to learn that way. Yeah, yeah, of course. You, you're, you're an entrepreneur, essentially. Right, exactly. Yeah, so what would be your advice to a current law student or a recent grad in terms of what they can do to better prepare themselves for the business of law if they're, let's say, like yourself, they're going into a, a private practice of their own? If you are in college and you haven't um, declared a major, I suggest declaring a business major, um, learning business management, business marketing, something like that. And you think, well, how is that going to help me in the practice of law? It doesn't matter. You could be a music major and still go to law school. It doesn't really make a difference. I think that will give you the base that you need when you come out. If you want to go on your own or start your own firm or start with a partnership, it gives you that business background and base that you need. Um, if you already graduated college and you're in law school, um, I'm not going to say go and learn business, you know, take business courses because you don't have time, you're in law school, but, but try to prepare yourself, you know, have, have a business plan, have a goal. Uh, one of the things that I, I made a mistake on, so at the eighth grade, the, this, this conversation I had, I want to be a lawyer now. So my goal is to be a lawyer, right? Well, you're in the eighth grade, and to be a lawyer is such a long time away that your, your main goal is to be a lawyer, but you don't have a goal after that. Okay. Then when I became a lawyer, I'm like, okay, I'm a lawyer. What do I do now? You know, I didn't think about that. <laughs> um, think, think things through. Okay. After I graduated law school, what do I want to do? Do I want to work for a firm? Do I want to go on my own? If I want to go on my own, when do I want to go on my own? Do I want to work for a firm first and do it? So I, I suggest planning it and, um, Learn how to write a business uh, plan. A business plan will help you go a long way, um, not just in the practice of law and just any practice. Well, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you're running a business no matter what at the end of the day. You are, you are. So, so the difference between me and someone who sells shoes or sells, sells ice cream is what I'm selling. I'm selling my service, they're selling a product, but running a business essentially is the same. We both need customers to buy our product, which is the ice cream or the, my services. You know, we have, um, we have rent to pay, we have, uh, you know, bank fees, we have all these different things, loans to pay. So running a business is running a business. It doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. And I, I would imagine that with law schools getting criticism over post-graduation employment, they're looking for students and prospective applicants who maybe have some more business experience to show that they know a little bit about what it's like in the real world. Right. Some people, you know, some people don't want to deal with that. So they go work for a firm or they go work for uh, the public defender's office. There's nothing wrong with that, but they don't have to worry about the business aspect of it. They, they just go to work. They're given the case and that's what they do. And sometimes I envy them, actually. Yeah, no, it's, it's there's definitely something uh, appealing about having everything taken care of for you. Right. Although that's not the route that you or I are choosing. But the, right. reason, I, the reason I focus on this is because with the economy, the shift in the economy, more and more people are in the position of hanging up their own shingles and having their own practices. The big, I mean, here in New York, and definitely getting a job at a big firm isn't as easy as it was ten years ago, and the right. salaries aren't the same either. Right, the competition is crazy. So we're in LA, um, and not just LA, but the, the entire state is saturated with lawyers. So the competition here is is different than in, in the different state where they have less lawyers. Um, and then the cost of living. Um, LA recently has caught up to, to New York and San Francisco and the cost of living. Um, so yes, you're, you're thinking, oh my God, yeah, I brought in $200,000, $300,000. Well, how much the, does that go in your pocket? You, know, you, you, have to, you have to sit there and analyze all that stuff. It, it's not just, okay, I bring all these people in, they're paying me all this money, I'm taking their other cases. No, it, it, it doesn't work like that. And nobody, Nobody talks about that in law school. They don't. And I, I understand why, because the law school is, is there to teach you the law. You know, you go to law school not to learn business, but you learn law. But I think it would be beneficial if they would have one or two classes you know, teaching you the business of law. Not, not business law, but the business of the practice of law. Well, that would be incredibly valuable. And so yes. to, to go with the reality a bit further, could you walk us through like an average day in your life of like what happens when you meet with clients and market and when does all that happen? So 
I practice, in my firm, we do all different kinds of things. I particularly do the criminal defense stuff. So I do a lot of criminal defense. But in my firm, we do, you know, personal injury, car accident, stuff like that. I spend a lot of my time on the road. So LA traffic is, I like to say it's worse than, than Manhattan traffic. And, and I believe so, it. I've heard. <laughs> so, and, you know, in, in criminal law, you have to be in court. There's no court call, things like that in criminal law. You can't just call and do that because people's constitutional rights are at stake. So they want everything done in person, at least in, in this state they do. So like today I drove about 40 minutes each way for a five minute appearance, but I had to do that. So I got up, got in the road, went to court, came back. By the time I came back to the office is 11 o'clock. And I've already lost two, three hours of productive work. So I spend a lot of my time driving if I have court. And sometimes we have to go to one, two, three courts in one day. So there's days that you never set foot in the office. Or by the time you come in the office, it's like 435 because you've been driving around in court, which I don't mind except for the traffic. If we didn't have that traffic, then it would be so much easier. Um, and then you try to squeeze in a networking event once or twice a week at night or sometimes in the morning, early in the morning. Um, and then you got to have client dates. I like to have, and I try, and sometimes it doesn't work. I like to schedule one day a week as an office day, meaning no court. I, don't, I try not to schedule court, and I come in the office, and I'm there the whole day. Um, believe it or not, I'm here on Saturdays a lot, catching up on my, on my work, because I'm, I'm not in the office. I'm always in court. And I love it. I love it. So average day for me is, court, office, maybe court in the afternoon, um, and then office again. And then at night, a networking event or a bar association meeting, something like that. So a lot of travel and also getting yourself out there. A lot of travel, getting yourself out there. And uh, yes, um, word of mouth is the best um, referral source, I believe. Uh, you can spend thousands of dollars on, on advertising and it works. but somebody referring you a case uh, is, is the best because that means that person trusts you. The person they referred you is, is going on that trust. And if you do a good job, then that person will then trust you too. And then you have one more referral source. It makes perfect sense. It's the, it's the same with, with LSAT prep as well, of course. Right. Right. Any, any service, I think. I'm wondering, are there, are there certain, you, say, you said paid advertising works, but but word of mouth is better. Are there certain, would you say that maybe paying too much for advertising is a, is a common pitfall some new lawyers make? What are some common pitfalls in general you see them make? I, I believe so. I, I, well, common pitfall is, you know, they say you have to have a website, which is true. Everybody has to have a website. But then there's these companies that tell you, look, come with us. We'll charge you this much. We'll get you a number one on Google. We'll get you on number one on Bing or whatever. Uh, and these certain search terms. Be careful about that because, all right, if this company is telling you that they're gonna make you the number one criminal defense attorney in LA, and they're representing four or five different criminal defense attorneys, how are they gonna make all of you number one, first of all? Second of all, you gotta look at the market you're in. It's easier for you to advertise uh, on the, you know, when I say keywords, you can actually buy keywords and show up in Google searches. Let's say I want to buy a criminal defense attorney and uh, I'm in Los Angeles. And for each person that clicks on that, I pay, I don't know, I'm using these figures as, as an analogy, like $10 or $20. Some keywords go for hundreds of dollars. But if you're in a smaller market, you don't have that much competition. So look where you are, look at your, your, your demographics, look who you're trying to reach, look where you are located, because the cost of advertising uh, could be a lot for little in return, depending on your locality. Um, if you spend a thousand dollars in, I don't know, um, Kansas City, Missouri, the population is much less than LA, but you also have much less competition, your $1,000 will go a lot. You spend $1,000 in Los Angeles on that same keyword, you're probably not going to get a, a, a good ROI on it. That makes a lot of sense. It's a very valuable insight. I remember when I first started my LSAT website, 
I heard about paid advertising. I tried it and like $50 of a budget was like gone in a day. And I'm like, where did all this money go? They, they just keep recurring the, the expenses there. But that's a very valuable insight. If you're in a smaller town, maybe the ad rep model does work because if you're the only lawyer in town, you buy the ads are cheaper right. and you'll show up. But in LA or big major markets, of course, there's a million lawyers who are all buying the ads and so they drive the price up. Really I was talking to this, to this older lawyer in, in LA and um, he was telling me this was the, I don't remember if he said it was the late 60s or the early 70s. Uh, he was the only criminal defense attorney within a 15 mile radius. He didn't need to advertise. There was nobody else there. <laughs> and you know, so if, if you needed a criminal def defense attorney and he lived in this 15 mile radius, he was the only one. So you went to him, there was no competition. Um, you know, the only thing advertising tool out there was the yellow pages. All you needed was a yellow page uh, the ad. And who uses yellow pages now? I mean, do you even see a yellow page anywhere? I, I, it, I don't even see them anymore. No, they're done, they're gone. <laughs> so that's another thing, a lot of people, uh, you, you have to learn how to go with the flow and the change in the advertising industry or not just the advertising industry, in the world itself, the technology that changes. A lot of successful attorneys that were making a lot of money back in the day um, when they refused to go into internet or they didn't actually keep up with it, uh, they lost that revenue and they, they had to play catch up and they could never catch up because somebody else was already there. So a lot of older people, they don't, YouTube, what's YouTube? I, I don't need to advertise on YouTube. I, I've been doing it on, on yellow pages. I'm doing fine. You got to learn to, to, to adapt. If you don't, if you can't adapt, just like in any other business, you're not going to, you're not going to succeed. That's a very valuable insight. And one thing I'm excited about, although it's tough, you know, for the new kids, new students graduating now, your recent grads for law school, is that they are web savvy and they will, I hope, make use of these technologies like YouTube, Facebook, Google, Twitter, et cetera. There's so many, there are so many opportunities out there and it's great to see someone like yourself leading the way with, you know, showing how it can be done. Now you've got your YouTube channel, you've got your podcast. Talk, talk a bit about your podcast, how sh it's hashing out the law. And hashing what, out the law, yes. what's the focus there? Are there particular episodes that might be useful for those applying to law school now to give them a sense of what law is like? Uh, yes. So uh, I wanted to start a podcast for a long time because I just thought it'd be a cool thing to do. Um, uh, and I and I liked interviewing people, so I thought, oh, this is I could kill two birds with one stone. I can have interviews, and and I could uh, you know advertise myself. But I didn't know how to start it. And I and to me, it's like, oh, you need all these technical equipments, and I you know you, how do I do this? And I was talking to a colleague of mine, and and she, she and I tell her, you know, I want to do a podcast, but I, I I keep procrastinating. I don't know what to do. And she looked at me, and she goes, well, why don't you give yourself a time limit and say, if I don't start a podcast within 30 days, I'm never going to do it again. It, it lit a fire under me. And, and, and I was thinking, you know what, she's right. So I went home and I decided I'm going to do the podcast and came up with a, you know, with the name, I had a name in the back of my mind. And, and, uh, and so I said, hashing out the law and it has to be about law, but I didn't want it to be, uh, you know, me and another lawyer just talking about law. Uh, I want it to be something that non-lawyers could listen to. Uh, yes, it has a law uh, twist to it, but something that people who are interested in law but really don't know about it or too afraid to, to learn about it uh, could listen to. And um, one of the episodes we had actually, uh, it's one of our most popular episodes, was this uh, woman who was not a lawyer, but she she had... Uh, a degree in medieval law and we talked about medieval law and she was telling and I was telling her well if we did this today this is the punishment what would it be in, in medieval times and um it was very interesting to me um so that was it and then we had a law school professor from Pace Law School on she talked about law school itself and one of the upcoming episodes that's going to be coming out is actually with you which is going to help the people who want to go to law school all about the LSAT and what the LSAT is like and how to prepare for it and things like that. So uh, we have another episode, it's about immigration law and it talks about the changes in immigration law with the new 
administration. Um, we had another episode about um, um, a lawyer who wrote a book about this trial that he had. Um, in fact, it's going to be airing. Uh, it, 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 it's it's going to air in early February. Um, by the time people see this, they're probably on there. Uh, he was in Pennsylvania, and he had a, a lawsuit that took about four years. It was against the Salvation Army, and it was the largest settlement in Pennsylvania history. So he talked about that and talked about the book, which talks about that case. Um, but I find it to be a very fun fun thing for me. I, I personally enjoy it. Um, I like to see it as a hobby, more of a chore. I, and for those people who are thinking about it, I, I suggest doing it. It, it. It's really fun. Great. Well, it's definitely inspiring to see you having so much fun with the practice of law between the practice itself, as well as your activities online, the marketing, YouTube, and the podcast. It sounds like you're really enjoying it and helping people out and getting your name out there at the same time. So you're definitely a great example for all the future law students to, to look to. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for letting me uh, be on your podcast. It's, it's a pleasure. Of course. Thank, thanks for joining today. It's great to connect with you again and look forward to many more. Thank you, Steve. You have a good day. You too. Take care.